So welcome to the second video in our series of our core practicals. Today we're going to be looking at core practicals 3 and 4, which can be covered in the Unit 3 paper of AS Chemistry. So core practical 3 and 4 are both very closely linked as they both involve a titration. However, core practical 4 is a slight difference as it requires you to also make a standard solution. Well, let's start with core practical 3. So the objective of this experiment is to find the concentration of a solution of hydrochloric acid. So we use a titration in order to give ourselves an accurate concentration of the acid or base solution. So our hydrochloric acid is our unknown and we titrate it against a known concentration. As I said, sometimes we make up a standard solution for this, but that's in core practical four. For core practical three, we will simply use a known concentration of sodium hydroxide. So that concentration is going to be 0 0.08 moles per decimeter cubed. We're of course going to have our hydrochloric acid, which is our unknown, and we're going to have a phenolphthalein indicator that will give us a nice colour change that's very easy for us to see. We will also have our burette, our pipettes, our pipette filler, a conical flask, a beaker, a funnel, and of course a volumetric flask. We're going to wear for safety, eye protection and suitable chemical resistant gloves as expected. We have to avoid any skin contact with our acid, our alkali or our indicator. And whilst this is a very strange safety rule, because it is pretty much common sense, we have to make sure that we always use a pipette filler to take up our liquid. We never ever want to use anything other than a special pipette filler. And of course, lastly, we want to make sure that we take care when we clamp our filler burette because we do not want it to crack or to topple over. One, these are quite expensive and two, of course, we do not want any broken glass. So how do we carry out this experiment? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to make our sample of our hydrochloric acid. So to do this, we wash out our volumetric flask with distilled water. We use a pipette to measure out 25 centimetres cubed of the hydrochloric acid, and we put that into the flask and make it up to the graduation mark with distilled or deionized water. We then take another 25 centimetres cubed sample from that flask, of our hydrochloric acid solution and we put it into a conical flask and we add a few drops of phenolphthalein indicator. Now at this point we should not see a colour change because phenolphthalein is colourless when it is in an acidic solution. We have to set up our apparatus for the titration, our sodium hydroxide goes into our burette and our hydrochloric acid goes into our conical flask. We then carry out our titration to titrate the contents of the flask against the sodium hydroxide and we record the titer to the nearest 0 0.05 centimetres cubed. We know that we have our final titer volume when we get this lovely permanent pink colour appearing in our conical flask. We of course need to conduct additional titrations. This first one is going to be our rough titration and we never ever want to use that in our calculations. So of course we need to conduct the additional titrations until we get concordant values and that means that they are within 0 0.2 centimetres cubed of each other. So here we have our diagram to show us how we set this up. So we have our burette which contains our first reactant which is of course our sodium hydroxide. We have our conical flask that contains our indicator and our hydrochloric acid and we use a white tile to help us see our colour change as clearly as possible. Whenever we are going to be using any of our equipment we should always be rinsing them out with the solution that's going to fill it beforehand. So for example with our pipette we should be rinsing it with our hydrochloric acid solution before we measure this, the, the sample out. We should also make sure that there are no air bubbles and the tip of the pipette because that will affect our volume and we also want to rinse our burette with the solution of our titrant so in this case NaOH before we actually fill it so of course we fill it and we open and close it by turning the tap making sure that when we are filling it that the tap is horizontal so that it is closed and nothing leaks out onto the floor and we don't have any spillages to report. So some example results on how we actually can carry out this is we have our 
first of all, our equation. So this is our step one in our calculations from balanced equations. So we can see that we have a nice one to one ratio between our sodium hydroxide and our hydrochloric acid. And in this case, we're going to say that our titer volume was 23.4. So from that, we can figure out our number of moles of our sodium hydroxide. And we use our triangle N, C, V. So our number of moles is equal to concentration times volume. So our concentration was 0 0.08 and we multiply it by 23.4 divided by 1000, of course, turning that into decimeters cubed and we get 0 0.001872 moles. Because they are in a one to one ratio, this is exactly the same number of moles of our hydrochloric acid. What we then have to do is we have to take into account the fact that we have scaled this up. So what we did is we took a 25 centimetre cube sample from a 250 centimetre cube flask. So within our sample, we have 0.001872 moles. So to go from our, our sample to our flask, we have to multiply it by 10. So our flask actually contains 0.01872 moles of hydrochloric acid. But again, this is an, a diluted sample because we did make it up with distilled water. And that distilled water is going to cause our hydrochloric acid to be diluted. We want to know what was the concentration in the diluted sample. So what we do is we take our number of moles and we take our sample, which was 25 centimetres cubed, and we have to convert that into decimeters. So we multiply it by 1000 divided by 25, and we get an overall concentration to be 0 0.7488 moles per decimeters cubed. And this is the concentration of our hydrochloric acid. Questions like this typically come up in unit three papers with calculations. They can also come up in unit two, but they will not ask you about any of the practical nature of this, but they could ask you the calculations. So some errors, we want to make sure that we allow the titrant or our sodium hydroxide time to drain down the walls of the, the burette before reading the volume. So once we close the tap, leave it for about 10, 15 seconds, allow it just to drain, and then we read our final volume. Of course, when we dilute our solutions, we're going to get a reading with a much smaller percentage error, which is the reason why we dilute them. And be aware that the phenolphthalein can turn back to colourless if it is left to stand, because the sodium hydroxide will react in the air with the CO2 and it will form sodium carbonate. So just be aware of that, that once we get that permanent pink colour, if it does go back to colourless, do not add any more of your um, sodium hydroxide. So let's look at a past paper question. We're going to look at June 2019. So we have a titration being carried out to find the concentration of propanoic acid. We are told that we use sodium hydroxide, 25 centimetres cubed at 0 0.102 moles per decimetre cubed. And our mean titer is 18.6. And we're told our equation which is lovely because we have a nice one-to-one -one ratio. So it makes that a little bit easier. And for three marks, we want to calculate the concentration of propanoic acid in grams per decimeters cubed. So just be aware that it's a little bit different when it comes to our units that we're going to use. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to work out our number of moles of our sodium hydroxide. And of course, that is concentration times volume. So we have... 0 0.102 times by 25 and that gives us an answer of 0 0.00255 moles. Okay, we then have, as we said, a one-to-one -one ratio. Therefore, we have 0 0.00255 moles of our propanoic acid. Okay, we can then figure out our concentration, which is the number of moles divided by the volume. <clears throat> so that's 0 0.00255 divided by 18.6 times 
divided by a thousand, so 0 0.0186, which gives us a number of moles, or sorry, a concentration of one, 0 0.137097. Sorry, let me rewrite that. 0 0.137097. Now, that would give us a concentration in moles per decimeters cubed, but we need to be aware that the question asks for grams per decimeters cubed. All we have to do is multiply it by the MR. And the MR, in this case, is 74. So our final answer, which is a mass concentration, is 0 0.137097 times by 74, which gives us 10.145 grams per centimetre cubed. And that's our final answer. Of course, we can also work out a percentage percentage uncertainty in this measurement. Again, this is a very typical question that we ask um, in a Unit 3 paper. And in order to do this, we have our uncertainty is 0 0.06, so we are told that in our question. So we have 0 0.06 divided by the volume of 25, and we multiply it by 100 to get our percentage uncertainty and we get an answer of plus or minus 0.24%. That means our final answer may be above or below it by 0.24% because we have to understand that we do have a slight uncertainty when it comes to working with a burette. Okay, again, our mark schemes are there. Should we wish to check our final answer? But let's look at one that goes into a little bit more detail. So this is from the January 2019 paper. It is very similar to our previous questions, um, but it is just going into a little bit more detail. So we have a chlorine-based bleach that contains sodium chlorate, and we can determine the titration, the sorry, the concentration by a titration with sodium thiosulfate. And we have our two equations here. So because we are reacting with sodium thiosulfate and it involves iodine, we always use this indicator as starch. Every single time we have iodine, we're going to have a starch indicator. Now because iodine is present at the start and it is then used up, we're going to get a nice blue-black colour. And once the reaction is finished, we should see a colourless solution and that is our colour change. You get one mark for starch and one mark for the colour change. However, if you give the correct colour change but do not say starch, you do not get a mark. So please be aware of that. Then part two asks us to complete the table of results. Well, this is just basic subtraction, which I'm sure everybody watching this video can do. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but our answers are 23.65, 22.80, 23.20 and 22.70. Note that I'm using two decimal places for every single answer because all of my values in my table also contain two decimal places and you should keep the same number of significant figures. Then part two, sorry, yet yeah, part two is asking us which results we should use in our mean value. Well, that's a case of looking at your values and determining, well, actually, values 2 and 4 should be used. The reason why, they are concordant results. And remember, concordant results mean that they are within 0 0.2 centimetres cubed of each other. The first one is a rough titration that we should not be using. Um, and our third one is completely out with our concordant results. So we want to make sure that we are using the correct values. So then we have to calculate our mean titer. So we had 22.8 plus 22.7. And we're dividing that by 2, which gives us a value of 22.75 centimeters cubed as our mean titer. 
we can then use that in order to calculate our number of moles of sodium thiosulfate. So our number of moles, of course, is going to be concentration times volume. So we have a concentration of 0 0.06 times a volume of 22.75 divided by 1,000. And that is going to give us an answer of 1.365 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. We can then work out our concentration of iodine. We need to be aware that this is a 2 to 1 ratio between the thiosulfate and the iodine. So I have to multi divide my answer sorry, by 2, which gives me 6.825 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. Now, similar to our worked example that we have previously, this is in 25 centimetres cubed, but we had a 25, 250 centimetres cubed volumetric flask. So we have to take 6.825 times 10 to the minus 4, and we have to scale it up by a factor of 10. So we get 6.825 times 10 to the minus 3 as our number of moles. If I then want to calculate, lastly, the concentration of sodium chlorate in the undiluted solution, I have to take into account the fact that I used a 10 centimetre cube sample. So I have 6.825 times 10 to the minus 3 times 1,000 divided by our 10, which is our sample, and I get a concentration of 0 0.6825 moles per decimeter cubed. And that is our final answer. Hopefully we've been able to follow how we've done those calculations. And if you do want to find more practice, you of course can find them in any past paper for unit three. And lastly, the mark schemes are there. So let's move on to core practical four. Now this is very similar where we do have titration, so I'm not going to go into doing all the titration calculations again. What we're going to focus on is we're going to focus on the standard solution. So this particular example, has, sorry, this particular experiment has two objectives to it. The first is to make a solution of a known concentration of acid, and then we use it to find the concentration of a solution of sodium hydroxide. So we need to know the definition of a standard solution. <clears throat> a standard solution is one which our concentration is accurately known. And the most common way that we prepare them is by dissolving a mass of a known, sorry, a known mass of substance in water. And we can use that to then accurately determine our concentration. So let's look at how we actually do this. So the first thing that we have to do, sorry, before we do it, let's just look at our safety and our apparatus. <clears throat> so we have our unknown concentration of sodium hydroxide. We're going to be using sulfamic acid as our standard solution, and this time we're going to be using a methyl orange indicator. We have all of the same, um, same apparatus as our titrations. The only difference is we need to add in our balance. We have our same safety um, as we had in the last core practical, making sure to wear goggles, gloves, always use a pipette filler and take care not to smash anything. So how do we do this? Well, we weigh an empty test tube and then we add approximately 2.5 grams of sulfamic acid to it and we accurately reweigh the test tube and its contents. Remember, we've discussed that this is known by weighing by difference. It was discussed in Core Practical 1. If you can't remember, go back and have a look at the previous video. We then dissolve that amount of sulfamic acid into 100 centimetres cubed of distilled water. We transfer the solution to a volumetric flask and we continue to wash out the beaker with distilled water or deionized water. And we transfer all of the washings into the volumetric flask. We should never, ever discard those washings because we're making sure we're getting all of our solid sulfamic acid. And then we make it up to the graduation mark, ensuring that our meniscus is sitting perfectly on the line. So what does that mean? Well, I'll show you a diagram in the top corner. If that's my graduation line, my meniscus should sit perfectly on it like that. 
<coughs> we then prepare our apparatus for titration. So we use a pipette to measure out our acid solution into a conical flask and we add some methyl orange and we titrate it against NaOH in order to get our, our titer volume. And of course, repeat until we have our concordant results within 0.2 centimeters cubed of each other. So with regards to just some key points, our diagram is pretty much the same. If you're not sure what a volumetric flask looks like, this is one here. And this is just an example of what we may use for our substance. This is not so famic acid. It's famic acid is a white substance, but this is just any, any salt that could be made into, or sorry, any solid acid that could be made into a standard solution. So the acid should have a high molar mass, and this is to reduce any weighing errors. It helps bring our overall percentage uncertainty down. The sample has to be pure because any impurities can affect our calculated concentration. And ideally, it should not be air sensitive or react with any of the components of air. So it shouldn't be used if it is going to absorb any water or carbon dioxide from the air. So some exemplar results, if we have sulfamic acid, here is our formula for that, NH2SO3H. Well, our mass of our weighing bottle and the sulfamic acid is 19.542 grams. After I've used all the sulfamic acid and I get my, I may have some traces left over, so this is my weighing by difference, I have 17.151 grams. That gives me a total mass of sulfamic acid as 2.391 grams. And using my molar mass, I can figure out what my, my number of moles is, which is 0 0.02462. And in my um, volumetric flask, it gives me a concentration of 0 0.0985 moles per decimeter cubed. Well, we then move on to be a... Uh, our, to our titration. So we have a nice one to one ratio once again, makes this nice and easy. And we have our four titers over here. And of course, we have to exclude our mean titer because we do not ever want to use that in a calculation. And we work out our rough titer volume to be 25.59 centimeters cubed. So we can work out how many moles of sulfamic acid that is, and it works out to be 2.45 times 10 to the minus 3, because it is a 1 to 1 ratio. That, of course, gives us 2.45 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of sodium hydroxide, which we can then use to calculate our concentration, and we get an overall concentration of 0 0.098 moles per decimeters cubed. Again, just a very standard calculation from balanced equation. Any errors that could arise from this? Well, most of them come from the preparation of the standard solution themselves. So we have to make sure that we don't lose any solid when transferring from the weighing bottle to the beaker, but that's why we do our weighing by difference. When we weigh out and we weigh it by difference, it should be the mass of the bottle and the beaker versus the mass of the empty bottle. So taking into account what we have actually put into our beaker. So let's have a look at a past paper question on, um, on standard solutions. Again, these can come in, con uh, in with titration calculations, but I'm not going to go through all of that again. As I said, I've already done that previously in the video. So we've got a 0 0.06 centimeter, sorry, moles per decimeter cubed sodium thiosulfate solution as our standard solution. We need to describe the steps that we would use to prepare this as accurately as possible. Of course, we would be supplied with the mass and our usual laboratory glassware, including a volumetric flask. The good thing about this, you do not need to do any calculations and it is a three mark question. So we're gonna have at least three points that we're gonna have to say here. So point number one, where we're gonna to have to dissolve our solid. That's a given because we cannot make a solution if we do not dissolve our water and do not dissolve our solid. And you have to specify that it is a distilled or deionized water. This just limits any impurities that we may have in our standard solution. We then pour the solution into our volumetric flask.
And we also have to make sure that we specify here that we do this with washings. Remember, we should never put our washings down the sink. It should always go into the volumetric flask just so that we can ensure that we are getting all of our solid being transferred. I then make the solution up to the graduated mark. Again, using distilled water. I put the lid on it and I shake or I invert, which means just to turn upside down. And that just allows me to shake and make sure that I'm completely mixing everything in my solution together. And that is basically how we make a standard solution. Okay, the mark scheme is there. Should you wish to go and have a look at it, there are two possible routes where we can get our three marks. But that's it for this video and that covers our core practicals three and four. Hopefully I will see you again soon when we cover core practicals five and six.